Good afternoon, children. How are you all? Hi. Very good. So, who was from Chill Derrick Primary School? Yes. And Grinling Gibbons? Yes. And Lucas Vale? You must yes. be here. Now, today I'm going to read you one of my favourite bits from Matilda. Has everyone read the book? Yeah. Did you like it? No, you haven't. Well, you're in for a treat today, then. Does everyone like it? Who's read it? Yes. yes. Is everyone nice and comfortable? Now, I'll get started with my favourite bit. This chapter is called Throwing the Hammer. The nice thing about Matilda was that if you had met her casually and talked to her, you would have thought she was a perfectly normal five-and-a-half-year-old child. She displayed almost no outward signs of her brilliance and never showed off. This is a very sensible and quiet little girl, you would have said to yourself. And unless for some reason you had started a discussion with her about literature or mathematics, you would never have known the extent of her brain power. It was therefore easy for Matilda to make friends with other children. All those in her class liked her. They knew, of course, that she was clever because they had heard her being questioned by Miss Honey on the first day of term. And they knew also that she was allowed to sit quietly with a book during lessons and not pay attention to the teacher. But children of their age do not search deeply for reasons. They are far too wrapped up in their own small struggles to worry over much about what others are doing and why. Among Matilda's newfound friends was the girl called Lavender. Right from the first day of term, the two of them started wandering round together during the morning break and in the lunch hour. Lavender was exceptionally small for her age, a skinny little nymph with deep brown eyes and with dark hair that was cut in a fringe across her forehead. Matilda liked her because she was gutsy and adventurous. She liked Matilda for exactly the same reasons. Before the first week of term was up, awesome tales about the headmistress, Miss Trunchall, began to filter through to the newcomers. Matilda and Lavender, standing in a corner of the playground during the morning break on the third day, were approached by a rugged ten-year-old with a boiler on her nose called Hortensia. New scum, I suppose, Hortensia said to them, looking down from her brick height. She was eating from an extra large bag of potato crisps and dug digging the stuff out in handfuls. Welcome to Borstal, she added. Spraying bits of crisps out of her mouth like snowflakes. The two tiny ones confronted by this giant kept watchful silence. Have you met the Trunchbull yet? The Tensia asked. We've seen her at prayers, Lavender said, but we haven't met her. We've got a treat coming to you, Tensia said. She hates small children. Therefore, loathes the bottom class and everyone in it. She thinks five-year-olds are grubs that haven't yet hatched out. In went another fistful of crisps, and when she spoke again, out sprayed the crumbs. If you survive your first year, you may just manage to live through the rest of your time here. But many don't survive. They get carried out on stretchers, screaming. I've seen it often. Potentia paused to observe the effect these remarks were having on the two titchy ones. Not very much. They seemed pretty cool. So the large one decided to regale them with further information. I suppose you know the Trunchbull has a lock-up covered in her private quarters called the Chokey. Have you heard about the Chokey? Matilda and Lavender shook their heads and continued to gaze up at the giant. Being very small, they were inclined to mistrust any creature that was larger than they were, especially senior girls. The Chokey, Hortensia went on, is a very tall, very narrow cupboard. The floor is only ten inches square, so you can't sit down or squat in it. You have to stand. And three of the walls are made of cement with bits of broken glass sticking out all over them, so you can't lean against them. You have to stand more or less at attention all the time when you get locked up in there. It's terrible! Can't you lean against the door? Matilda asked. Don't be daft, Hortensia said. The door's got thousands of sharp, spiky nails sticking out of it. They've been hammered through from the outside, probably by the Trunchbull herself. Have you ever been in there? Lavender asked. My first term, I was in there six times, 
he said. Twice for a whole day, and the other times for two hours each. But two hours is quite bad enough. It's pitch dark, and you have to stand up dead straight, and if you wobble at all, you get spiked either by the glass on the walls or the nails on the door. Why were you put in? Matilda asked. What had you done? The first time, the Chancellor said, I poured half a tin of golden syrup onto the seat of the chair the Tonchable was going to sit on at prayers. It was wonderful. When she lowered herself into the chair, there was a loud squelching noise, similar to that made by a hippopotamus when lowering its foot into the mud on the banks of the Limpopo River. But you're too small and stupid to have read the Just So stories, aren't you? I read them, Matilda said. You're a liar, Hortensia said amiably. You can't even read yet, but no matter. So, when the trunchbull sat down in the golden cell, the squelch was beautiful. And when she jumped up again, the chair sort of stuck to the seat of those awful green breeches she wears and came up with her for a few seconds until the thick syrup slowly came unstuck. Then she clasped her hands to the seat of her breeches and both hands got covered in the muck. You should have heard her bellow. But how did she know it was you? Lavender asked. Hmm. A little squirt called Ollie Bob Whistle sneaked on me, Hortensia said. I knocked his front teeth out. And the trunch will put you in the chokey for a whole day, Matilda asked, stopping. All day long, Hortensia said. I was off my rocker when she let me out. I was babbling like an idiot. What were the other things you did to get put in the chokey, Lavender asked. Oh, I can't remember them all now, Hortensia said. She spoke with the air of an old warrior who has been in so many battles that bravery has become commonplace. It's all so long ago, she added, stuffing more crisps into her mouth. Oh, yes, I can remember one. Here's what happened. I chose a time when I knew the trunchbull was out of the way teaching the sixth formers, and I put my hand up and asked to go to the bogs. Instead of going there, I sneaked into the trunchbull's room, and after a speedy search, I found the drawer where she kept all her gin knickers. Go on, Matilda said, spell that. What happened next? Well, I had sent away by post, you see, for this very powerful itching powder, Tensing said. It cost 50 pence a packet and was called the Skin Scorcher. The label said it was made from the powdered teeth of deadly snakes, and it was guaranteed to raise welts on your skin the size of walnuts. So, I sprinkled this stuff inside every pair of knickers in the drawer, and then folded them all up again carefully. Tensia paused to cram more crisps into her mouth. Did it work? Lavender asked. Well, Hortensia said. A few days later, during pre- the trunchbull suddenly started scratching herself like mad down below. Aha, I said to myself, here we go. She's changed to the gym already. It was pretty wonderful to be sitting there watching it all and knowing that I was the only person in the whole school who realised exactly what was going on inside the trunchbull's pants. And I felt safe too. I knew I couldn't be caught. Then, the scratching got worse. She couldn't stop. She must have thought she had a wasp's nest down there. And then, right in the middle of the Lord's Prayer, she leapt up and grabbed her bottom and rushed out of the door. Both Matilda and Lavender were enthralled. It was quite clear to them that they were, at this moment, standing in the presence of a master. Here was somebody who had brought the art of skullduggery to the highest point of perfection. Somebody, moreover, who was willing to risk life and limb in pursuit of her cause gazed in wonder at this goddess, and suddenly even the boil on her nose was no longer a blemish, but a badge of courage. But how did she catch you that time? Lavender asked, breathless with wonder. She didn't, Hortensia said, but I got a day in the chokey all the same. Why? they both asked. The trunch boy, Hortensia said, has a nasty habit of guessing. When she doesn't know who the culprit is, she makes a guess at it. And the trouble is, she's often right. I was the prime suspect this time because of the golden syrup job, and although I knew she didn't have any proof, nothing I said made any difference. I kept shouting, Miss Trunchbull, how could I have done it? I didn't even know you kept any spare knickers at school. I don't even know what itching powder is. I've never heard of it. 
that the lying didn't help me in spite of the great performance I put on. The trunchbull simply grabbed me by one ear and rushed me to the chokey at the double and threw me inside and locked the door. That was my second all-day stretch. It was absolute torture. I was spiked and cut all over when I came out. It's like a wall, Matilda said. You can rely on us, Lavender said, making her height of three feet two inches stretch as tall as possible. No, I can't, Hortensia said. You're only shrimps. But you never know. We may find a use for you one day in some undercover job. <laughs>